but he's in what's what we call, have you ever heard of the golden handcuffs? No, I don't think so. I mean, the golden handcuffs are, they give you enough that quitting is a real risk. Like if you have a $250,000 a year job in Florida, that's a real risk to quit, yeah. right? And they give you stock options and they make it seem like you're making a lot of money, but you are handcuffed mm-hmm. and there's no getting out. And then you get a house, then you get a family and that's it. You're just locked in for life. You need to be prepared that if you're going to try to be an entrepreneur, you probably have to do things differently than your friends. If you're looking to the left and you're looking to the right and they all have jobs, you're gonna operate differently. If you have a job, that means that you're not gonna be able to take a vacation. You are not gonna be able to watch Netflix. What's up, y'all? Welcome back to another LT360 podcast. You know me, D. Foss, the host, and I'm here today with a personal training client of mine, someone down here in South Florida in Boca Raton. His name is Chad Castell. He is, uh, like I said, a personal training client of mine. He has a plethora of knowledge in entrepreneurship, business, and many other industries. So I wanted to invite him on to share his knowledge and also some of his cool experiences, uh, movie-like experiences, we could say that. (laughs) And uh, I hope he is going to be someone who can share some of that stuff with you and you'll be able to walk away with some, you know, kind of insights into how day-to-day life looks and how you can take advantage of the skill sets you have. So I'm going to let him introduce himself. Chad, thank you for hopping on, man. Uh, Thank you for having me on, Dylan. Um, Just touch base and low what you said. I am an entrepreneur. Um, I've uh, used that skill set to get into day trading, which I've been doing for 10 years, and real estate investing, which I've been doing for four. And in the last year, really uh, took it on as a full-time gig. So if, if you had to explain your day-to-day life right now, what does that look like? Uh, right now, get up early, um, go to the gym, uh, social media for the real estate stuff. Um, I have a family, so play with my daughter some mornings and then, um, day trade from nine 30 to four, uh, during the day, I'll be taking phone calls about real estate, whether it's negotiating, talking to my partner, talking about tenants, like whatever the operations that he might need some guidance on, or we have to go back and forth on. And then after work, phone calls, podcasts like this, um, usually shut it down by about 6 PM, except on Mondays, Mondays, I, t- I tend to make my hardest day. I try to make Monday a 14 hour day so I can make every other day a little bit shorter. And my mentality is the week can only get better from there. If you make Monday a really hard day. I like that perspective. I've recently taken the opposite approach where like I typically work a lot on Saturday, Sunday as well. So I've taken the opposite approach of, okay, let me make Monday a lighter day. Um, I do teach class at night and everything like that, but I like the ideology of if I make Monday rock solid, then the rest of the week will probably seem easier. Yeah. And, um, I've toyed around with different things. We all have, you have to kind of do what's best for you, which will evolve depending on where you are in life and your energy levels. Um, I know that my energy levels tend to be pretty high on Monday because I don't, I don't typically do a lot on Sunday. I get a good night's sleep so I can kind of handle it. And then on Wednesdays, I typically let myself sleep in. I don't set an alarm unless there's a reason to get up. And then I kind of recover midweek and then can kind of go hard the rest of the week. Also it's because I stare at eight monitors. Um, my eyes are tired. And on the weekend, it I could work more. I could work six, eight hours and it doesn't feel like I'm working. Whereas during the week, because I'm staring at those monitors all the time, it, I don't know. I can't really explain it, but the weekend is, even though I work, it doesn't feel like work. I definitely can relate to that. When I, you know, when we come in and train on Saturday mornings and I have, you know, a five or six hour block where it's like just one thing to the next to the next, but knowing that I'm going to be done at one o'clock. And even if I have things lined up where going out or, you know, going to socialize and do things like that, it just seems easier. It seems lighter on a Saturday or Sunday, whatever, just, just, whatever mentally, yeah, you know, wherever you're at, you should, you should just, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm very big on, um, what's the pill, uh, what's the pill, the placebo effect. The placebo effect. Whatever, whatever gets you in the right mindset, as long as it isn't dangerous and it's efficient, like just go with it. 
or harmful to others, right? We don't want yeah, that. Yeah, like, <laughs> harmful to others. I'm not a complete pig. Like if it's harmful to others as well, you probably shouldn't do it. Yeah, as long as it's within the moral compass. I mean, whatever gets you going, gets you going. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So can you kind of give a, a background as to what your growing up life was like? I know you grew up up north. So that for me usually tells us how someone develops some sort of skill set or some sort of perspective on the world, why you might be so go getting, how you've gained some of this insight into like entrepreneurship and why sure. that seems to work for you. Um, so I grew up in a middle class family in upstate, or I'm sorry, in South Jersey. Um, and my parents were entrepreneurs, but my parents lived hand to mouth no matter how much money they made. And I don't care if you make a million dollars a year, if you spend a million dollars, you're, you're paycheck to paycheck. If you don't have investments and that's really why parents did. So I, uh, I had a good childhood. They were loving and supporting and they did their best. And, but I watched them go broke twice. Once when I was 10, you know, watching my dad break down and cry over certain, certain things. And then once again, in the crash in 08, and I don't know so much about when I was 10, but in the 08, um, uh, the 08 crash, it's, as an adult, I can look back and go, you guys didn't plan for anything to go bad. Mm. And that's a really important, you have to plan for stuff to go bad. So that, if you want to ask is like how that affected me is I grew up in this, that environment and people either kind of go with it or they go against it. And I'm the one who was like, no, I'm not doing that. I scared to, um, I also, my mom was like, she was one of these people that had the best energy you could ever meet. I mean, she could sell you on anything and make you feel good about it. <laughs> but she also um, lied too much and tried to pull the wool over people's face and almost got like a kick off of it. And so that was the environment I grew up in. And I had to shift off of that. You know, like I thought that was normal. And uh, by the time I got to midway through college, I started to kind of get away from that. And I had to rebrand myself because I was like that. I was shifty and like not trustworthy. And I had to rebrand myself and I, it took me a long time, but I was able to do that. And, um, uh, just another thing to touch on. I don't want to go too much my childhood, but yeah, in my early twenties, um, in my early twenties, um, is we're going to cover why this, why I got into these mentality, uh, shortly in my early twenties. Um, uh, I said over the course of my teens, um, my parents, um, took out a credit card in my name to help build my credit. It was a really good thing they did. But then when the crash happened, my parents got involved in drugs. They got addicted to pills. Then they ended up taking that credit card, which had a $40,000, um, limit on it and spent it. And I had $10,000 in the bank, which I had set up. I had account, a joint account set up when I was like 12 or 13 that I kept putting money into and they cleared that out. So they, they took 50,000 for me and I didn't have, you know, 40, that, that was when I was 22, 23, I was out of college with nothing going on. And, you know, just it forced me to take more responsibility for everything. You know, it's like, okay, I'm in the spot. What do I do now? And I learned that unfortunately I had two options at the time. I could, I could, uh, do nothing or I could file a complaint against my dad and he would have gotten prosecuted. So I chose to do nothing, uh, but it was a really bad spot to be in as a 22 year old, you know, mm -hmm. like it's not fair. It's not right. But yet, you know, life presents you with challenges and you have to work, you have to work through them. Very interesting. And to completely skip to present day, you have a good relationship with your parents. You don't have a relationship. Are they still here? What does that look like? Uh, so, uh, unfortunately they're not, neither are still alive. Um, my dad, um, they had moved down to Florida. I helped them move, which was a mistake. I was financially taking care of them. Uh, uh, they were drinking behind my back. I caught them. I caught them. You know, they were doing things they weren't supposed to do. I finally cut them off. I wouldn't answer their phone calls. I wouldn't talk to them. Um, my dad unfortunately passed away about two months after I cut them off. So I never spoke to him again and we never got on good terms. And I never hated him. Um, like I know what addiction is and I know how hard it is, 
Um, so I didn't hate him for his addiction. I hated him for his decisions leading up to that. Like when he was sober for a really long time. So when you're about to pick up the bottle again, you're supposed to go to meetings. Like he knew what he was supposed to do and he let himself get to that point. So I was not thrilled with him. Um, fortunately, um, he, uh, a day after I cut him off, he got clean again and started going to meetings and his sponsor, um, contacted me and said that if it wasn't for me, he wouldn't have gotten clean. So that gave me some, it, it, it was kind of a dual edged sword. I wish I would have cut them off earlier. I was talking about it. Like I wanted to years earlier and my wife wouldn't let me cause she's a sweet person. And she's like, you don't cut off family. Yeah. She finally said, okay, you can cut them off. So cut them off. Fortunately he passed away, but there was some silver lining to that where, you know, and then my mom, she survived for a while. Um, she, she got herself clean. She got herself a job. Um, she ended up getting engaged again. She was doing well. You know, she had, um, uh, uh, she had held a job for a while. She had gotten to the point where my wife liked her again and she was welcome to our house anytime. So that was a really nice thing. Um, me and her had gotten to a neutral spot, um, uh, for her last birthday, not this August, the August before that I called her up and I, and I told her that, you know, let's start looking at homes in uh, 55 and older communities. I'm going to buy our house, which was a really nice step for us. Mm-hmm. Um, and unfortunately, uh, last October, she got diagnosed with stage four cancer and she was gone two months later. So, uh, uh, but we're in a good spot. You know, we got at least to neutral. We would have been better, but I was too busy working. I was working 90 hours a week. I didn't have time to progress the relationship. Mm-hmm. And it's unfortunate because she died in before we could get back to like a great spot. Cause I love, as a kid, I was really tight with my parents. Yeah. And it, and it seems like you've, um, I could be wrong, but it seems like you don't necessarily have resentment, which it seems like you, you made amends with, um, where you got to be with them when they did pass and all of that. So that, um, I mean, that says a lot, man, you've, you've definitely put your head down and worked through, uh, quite a bit, not only from the situation that you mentioned at 22, 23, where you said, okay, now I have to take financial responsibility. I have to be my own, you know, backfall, right? I have to, I have to trust fall on myself. So I'm not letting anyone else, you know, kind of get in my way and you prioritize that and you've gotten to that place, which then allowed you to try to give back. Right. And which is kind of crazy to think, uh, after your parents said that to you at 22, 23 with the money that you were still saying, Hey, I'll help you move down to Florida. And you did that for them. So I think that just speaks to your character. Um, and ultimately it speaks to them and how they raised you. Right. Uh, so, yeah, uh, it's, it's a mixed bag there. Um, you're right. I don't have resentment. Um, there are days where I do, you know, it's not, nothing's cut and dry. Uh, sure. I'm mostly yeah, at peace yeah. with it. Um, I mostly am upset that I feel robbed that I have, they have grandkids and my grand my parents would have been the grandparents that were over every day, like wanting to spend time with their grandkids. They would have been great grandparents. And that that's where I have the most, you know, it just, it feels so unnecessary and, uh, but it's life. So, you know, there's no perfect, uh, there's no perfect way to do it. No, absolutely not. And it, it's less about, um, you know, the, trying to get more, but it's more about making the most of what you have. Right. So, um, man, all crazy stuff, uh, things I would have never gotten into if it wasn't. Yeah. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not something you can like throw out in, uh, like average conversation. Yeah. <laughs> hey, by the way, uh, my parents stole 50 grand from me and both are dead and my mom died on my birthday. I forgot to mention that too. Like on your birthday. Yeah which uh, is just random luck, right? You got a one in 365 chance of that happening, but uh, it's unfortunate. It can't, it's, yeah, wow. What day is that, if you don't mind me asking? I don't, it's December 15th. Shh, you're the day after mine? Yeah. I didn't, well, I didn't know yours was the 14th, but <laughs> I guess we're brothers. Yeah, mind-boggling, wow. 
So yours gets just as forgotten as mine when it comes to like the whole holiday thing. Oh yeah. There were years where I just refused to celebrate it or acknowledge it. I'm like, we're not celebrating this until January 15th. (laughs) Everybody's away. Everybody's away. As a matter of fact, two of my best birthdays, one was in November and one was January 5th. Like, cause everyone's away. Like it's, it's holidays. It's my, it's just, yeah. Crazy. So let's jump back to your 22, 23. Uh, you just graduated college. This, yeah. this whole credit card situation happened. You got your degree in what? Got my degree in sport management. Okay. With the intention of being a sport agent. Mm-hmm. And where did you get that from? Rutgers university. You went to Rutgers. Nice. Yeah. Cool. So then that whole thing happens. You've now graduated with this degree. And what is, what is your first job out of college? What did you start doing? So I grad, so I graduate or, um, you know, like I, I need to take uh, I need like one more credit. So I, I take an internship with the New York Knicks, which was accredited thing. So I work at the, I work for the New York Knicks. I'm, I'm living in Brooklyn in a one bedroom studio with two other guys. I'm sleeping on the floor. We have cockroaches. It's not the nicest place. Wow. Um, I'm also working for their events department because their internship didn't pay very much. Um, and then in the spring, I continued working for the Knicks. And then I also worked, uh, intern for a sport agent, you know, give myself kind of a well-rounded thing. And then, um, I got a job. My first, I guess, official adult job was a janitor in a hotel in Brooklyn called Hotel Le Bleu. Wow. And... Uh, I don't know if you've ever cleaned up vomit, but I did and I don't love it. So <laughs> <laughs> I've cleaned it up quite a few times after my shout out to my friends who used to throw up during the parties I threw. <laughs> well, it's a little different. You know, we've all done that. We've all held yeah, someone's yeah. hair back or whatever, but uh, not fun, not fun to get paid to do it. So I took my um, shifts and I started to learn how to work front desk. So I got out of that pretty quickly, maybe a couple months Okay, and went to the front desk. And this was a hotel in downtown Brooklyn. Uh, I mean, I don't know if it was downtown Brooklyn. It was, yeah, it was like, I was on the F train. I know this is terrible. It was like third and 15th street, I think is where I lived. And then it was like a 10 minute walk. I don't even know if it was East or West. <laughs> <laughs> some direction. <laughs> yeah, some direction. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, so I lived in uh, Park Slope. So it was right on that edge of Park Slope. Okay. Yeah. And y- you decided that the whole sports agent thing wasn't really where you wanted to go. So, yeah. So I went to work with this agent. I worked and he was a really great guy. Um, I, truthfully, I wasn't mentally ready to take on the responsibility, but I still saw him. He, he was, he was, he was an NFL guy. He started with, um, you know, uh, undrafted peep players. He would fund their process from graduation to the draft where, um, or, uh, where he would, you know, pay for training and all this. And then they would go on drafted or they would get drafted and then they would get picked up by team. Mm-hmm. And so he was like hoping to guess on which players and, you know, I think I, I think I interned when he was about 10 years in and I think he was finally getting to like fourth and fifth round draft picks. So I'm looking, I'm like, all right, this guy's grinding it out. Maybe year 20, he's doing first round draft picks or maybe signing good, uh, uh, signing good players. But it's like, that's a really big front end, uh, and, uh, sacrifice a lot of hours for maybe not a payoff. Do I love this? And if the answer is no, and I'm just doing it for the money or the fame, it's like, well, we can do things that have a little bit higher, a little bit higher floor. So that's really my conclusion. And then with the Knicks, I watched these, I got lucky in the sense of where I ended up now, but I got unlucky in that the Knicks were a bad organization to work for. There was a lot of pompous behavior. People didn't, they didn't care about you at all as an intern. There was nobody helping me. And I tried in the beginning, like I was trying, uh, but um I was watching these guys. They were acting like they were the biggest deals in the world. And I don't know what they were making, but it wasn't a lot. Let's say, let's just say it was a hundred thousand dollars, a hundred thousand dollars at 30 years old in New York city. is not a lot of money. I mean, your take home after taxes is 50,000. I don't even know what you're left over after living expenses. Yeah. So they're working all these hours for not that much money. I was just looking at them and go, I don't want that either. Very much how I felt when I was with the Patriots. Yeah. 
because as an intern, I was doing 13, 14 hour days uh, in preseason, like four months before the season even started. Right. And these other athletic trainers, there was two that were there for basically 20 years by each other's side. And then there was three others. And it's not that they didn't have necessarily a great relationship with all the players. They'd go hang out with the players and all of that because the players spend more time in the athletic training room than almost anywhere. Yeah. And it's kind of their leisure time. Like they get to get treatment and kind of, you know, lacklusterly talk and, and just be guys. So you create that bond. <clears throat> but the more I talked to the, you know, the athletic trainers, the more I realized that they did absolutely nothing other than that. They had no other life. It was hang out with the players outside. It was hang out with the players inside and it was work. And that was, that was it. Um, they didn't know anybody else. They didn't hang out with anybody else. And it was something that for me being in new England, especially was like, I don't want to be here 12 hours a day, never see the sun once. <clears throat> and then just continue to do that in hopes that I can be here for a long period of time and they'll increase my pay. Yeah. I don't, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, traveling 24 seven, you'll get to see cool places and experience cool things. Obviously like they have Super Bowl rinks and stuff like that. They've been to, you know, if there's an organization in football to work for, it's probably that one, but uh, it just, the athletic training thing just seemed such like a underpaid, um, you know, position that wouldn't allow you to kind of go create a life that you want. You're just, you're just kind of putting shoes on that are already there living a life and you're just stepping into them. Yeah. It seems like it's, it, it's a life that looks glamorous from the outside and there are glamour parts of it, but it seems like there'd be 10 awesome days a year. Yeah. But everything else kind of sticks. Yeah. Everything else is very much just through the mundane, motion mundane and you're, you're, you are trying to fix everyone's problems. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, I just didn't see that that was something for me and I, you know, general health and wellness, uh, I had already started my master's in nutrition. It was like the problem with America is not that these millionaire athletes are dying of cardiac disease and type two diabetes and blah, 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 super early on. And they're obese and that's their issue. Like, no, these guys right now are, they have access to absolutely anything they want. Yeah. So I'm trying to get them from 99% to a hundred where there's seven billion people out there that need to go from 10% of their optimal health to, to 85, just to right. Longer. like well i can take all those skills that i know and kind of apply it there and that's why i ended up moving down here and people were told me i was crazy when i said um they offered me to kind of stay with the pats but i'm gonna move to florida and go live on my sister's couch <laughs> well we're gonna talk about people a lot because people have had a lot of opinions on my life mm -hmm. and they're normally ignorant they're ignorant opinions yeah. They're not based in fact or your perspective or why it matters. Now, if you told me that you turn on a million dollar a year job for that, I would have said, yeah, you're making a mistake. Do it for three or four years, bank the money and then do something fine. Mm -hmm. But you didn't do that. You turned on a job with very low ceiling and very low quality life. Yeah. Because it's, but it's a great cocktail party job when you go to, <laughs> or when you go to weddings. Yeah. Yeah. You, it's an, ex, it's an experience and undoubtedly that's what we're here for, but I, it just didn't seem like the timely one at the, you know, the rate that I was seeing myself grow entrepreneurially. No, like uh, that doesn't seem like it's for me. We had very similar outlooks and similar type experiences. Mm -hmm. So now you leave, uh, well, now you're working this hotel job. Yeah. Um, you've kind of decided that working for the Knicks nor, you know, doing the sports agent thing, neither one kind of seems like it's for you. What was the next step? How did you transition all of those um, kind of like checkbox uh, things off the list and then say, okay, I want to get into day trading and investing. Um, so it's not that I really wanted to get in day trading and investing. I figured out and I wouldn't have been able to quantify it then, but I knew that money was freedom 
to me, money was never material things. It's not that I didn't want material things, but it's not, it's not what it was about. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I was, I was in New York and I was going to continue in the hotel business. And I really liked my manager and then she got fired. And so I decided that I was going to make a lot more money. If I went back to South Jersey, I have a lot of experience teaching tennis. Mm. Um, I had connections with the city and I was just going to start. I had taught tennis over summers um, uh, for a few years. So when I would go back home, I would teach tennis in the summers in my local town. So I was like, all right, it's June. I'm going to go back for the summer. I'm going to teach tennis. And that's what I did. I just went back for that summer and I taught tennis. And then I got a call from a buddy who said, um, Hey, in Philadelphia, they're opening up a new casino. They need dealers. I, I got a sport management degree. Mm -hmm. There's no sport management store. Yes. So <laughs> I'm like, all right, I need a job. So that summer I spent, I would go up to Philadelphia from like 7am to noon. No, 7am to 3pm. I would come back, um, teach tennis from like four or 5pm to 10 and then just do it all over again. And I did that. And then I started dealing at the casino, uh, se uh around September. And then, um, so you were asking about day trading. My best friend had gotten into an office of day traders and he, he was promoting me to get into the office because he, he knew I had the temperament to be successful. Mm -hmm. He wasn't sure if I had the mental capacity, but he knew that I, I was, uh, very disciplined, which is a very important skill set. Mm -hmm. So I'm in the casino and, uh, should I continue to do more questions? Do you want to? No, no, no. I like where this is going. Um, and it's funny because Josh, the other day when I was training him mentioned the whole tennis thing. Okay. Yeah. Which I know we didn't talk about. It's all good. Uh, yeah. I, it was, it was, seems like it was pretty quick. It wasn't a, it was a seasonal thing. It wasn't like a, uh, it, it was more, it was more deep than that as far as my playing career and who became my mentor, my coach was my mentor. And then I ended up teaching later in later on, which I'll kind of get to, um, but Let's I was the, the brush stroke and then we'll go back and look at the facts and, sure. each. um, so I'm dealing in the casino. The casino is a very incestuous, um, business. Uh, it's great for a 25, I was a 25 year old male, you know, single, it was fun but it's also a very jealous business. Mm -hmm. And the way I was treated from different bosses, I had very supportive bosses and I had very jealous bosses. And I was getting pushed pretty quickly. Like the shift managers all liked me. They knew I responded well to criticism. And so I was getting room to become a manager. I would have been one of the first people in management, but I saw how jealous and people tried to get me fired, like legitimately tried to get me fired. And, uh, I was like, I don't want to do this. So I had decided, so it was from September to March in March, my buddy called me. He was like, look, you're not going to, you're not going to get in the trading office. It's not going to happen. I was like, hoping that I'd get in the office. Like, it's not going to happen. There's just no space. So I decided I was going to go back to school to become a teacher. I really like teaching. Mm. And then in April, so I signed a one year lease in April. And then in May I get a call. All right. Actually, you are going to get a job. You're going to get a job trading. <laughs> <laughs> So I signed one year lease in, in April and May. I moved back down to uh, my hometown because that's where the trading office was. Wow. Just like that. Life happens, right? Twist you upside. Yeah. And, and again, you know, I quit a job where I had full benefits. Um, I had a great schedule. I was working 12 to 8 PM. I had weekends off. I had seniority. Yeah, it was, a, I, that was the best schedule I've ever had. Mm. Um, I had seniority and my family was what you're, wait, you're quitting, you're quitting your job to trade in which you have zero guaranteed income. I'm like, yep. And because I knew what the ceiling was of trading and I know, I knew what my ceiling was for being in the casino business. And that was, if I stay in the casino business, maybe by year 20, I'd be making, maybe I'd be a, a higher up boss making 150,000 a year. And there's nothing wrong with that life. I'm never here to criticize someone's life. that makes you happy, but I wanted a higher ceiling than that. Mm -hmm. So I knew I had to take a risk and I knew the time was now. It's like, I'm never going to get an opportunity like that. Mm -hmm. So when I quit, I went all in mentally, physically, like I designed my life around trading for a long time. Interesting. So 
<clears throat> that trading, that learning curve, what would you say was the hardest thing for that? Was it something that was tangible, like a an actual day trading skill, or was it more of a mental capacity that you had to learn? What was the biggest like uh, challenge that you kind of came across when when getting into it? Um, I, there, there, I don't think there was one big one. I think there were several several ones. I was disciplined, but I needed to develop more discipline. <laughs> you're going to get kicked in the teeth, right? Like you're going to lose money. Yeah. It, I, I, I don't have every day is not a winning day and every trade is not a winning trade and trade and dealing with that is important. Being able to get back up and analyze the situation and go, sometimes you make a good trade and you lose money and you have to analyze that and go, I need to do that again. And sometimes you make a good trade and you win money. Oh, sorry. And you make a bad trade that you end up winning money on. And you needed to say, I don't, I, that was actually a bad decision. Mm -hmm. So those kind of skill sets are just stuff I had to develop. And really the challenge was just time, just sticking with it, not pressing and not trying to make too much too fast. And the discipline in life is really what I think gave me the major benefit. Because as soon as I started making money, I didn't start spending money. I said, this could be gone tomorrow. I need money in case I take a loss. I don't want to overextend myself. So I live with my parents as long as I possibly could. Interesting. When did you, um, when did you finally leave living with your parents? So uh, just to kind of touch back on something you had said before, my parents had stolen that money from me when I was 21, 22. I actually didn't find out about it until I was 24, right, right before I started with the casino. Yeah. Because I was a dumb kid. I didn't know about credit scores. I knew they existed, but I didn't even know mine. And the casino made me check my credit. So I see my credit score is like 500. And I see like all these delinquent payments. And I'm like, I don't have a Discover card. I don't have this. And that's how I found out. Wow. So I'm in this spot. I'm really pissed at my parents. But I'm starting a new job. And then six months later, I decide to start a new, another new job. I move back home so I can be pissed at them and have a pretty place to stay mm -hmm. or I can be pissed at them and and spite myself. So I live with them uh, from May until November. Um, I actually ended up paying them rent, not because they asked me to, but just because I thought it was the right thing to do. Even though they owed me money, it was just they no, were no, no, that they were. Are you a Gary Vee fan? Uh, yes, in uh, principle, but no, uh, in I don't like. I think the Gary Vee method is awesome. I don't think more than like one percent of people can work the way he works. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yes, I love his energy. I, mm -hmm. A lot of things he says are definitely correct for people. Like yeah. live with your parents. Yes, and that's and definitely. yeah, that's ultimately. He, he'll talk about live with your parents, but he'll also talk about if they hold that over your head and that messes with you mentally in any way, then you have to be the first one to cut the ties or yeah. to give them money. Right. And say like, listen, you're not asking for it, but I don't feel right about myself if yeah. I don't. So <clears throat> that's huge. And I, I think that was a big part of like me moving down here. Yes, I was sleeping on Haley's couch. Yes, for uh, a couple months, I had nothing to put up front, but it wasn't costing her anything more to house me, uh, essentially, right? So Very little. Some more yeah. utilities, but... Yeah. Um, so uh, that, that ability to just like step away from my parents completely, not live with my dad, um, and then immediately i mean buying a car finding a job having insurance adding all that to my plate just made me go okay i have no choice um and that's where i've always kind of put myself like and it sounds like you do too if i'm jumping i'm jumping a hundred percent in i'm putting my back up against the wall kind of thing yeah where like i kind of have to battle myself to get through it i'm not really battling anything else if i put the time in it's going to work I think we both have that kind of mindset of <clears throat> if I put myself in a situation, I have no doubt that I can make the most of it, but the, um, the audacity that it takes 
in a sense to do that and put yourself in that situation is what makes other people look at you and say, that's so stupid. Why would you quit that job with benefits? Why would you do this? Why would you do that? Well, they just don't look at things in, in your in context. It's like, yeah, if I was a 50 year old guy with family, it's like, that's a really bad move. But it's like, I don't know. I felt like I could get another 15 to $20 an hour job. And at some point, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, <clears throat> totally understandable. So let's jump back to the tennis thing. Then. What I, I wasn't aware that you were uh, uh, an avid tennis player, that you were very good in high school. What did that look like? I mean, I was a good high school player. I was the number one singles on my team. Um, I met my tennis coach who was, I don't know, around 60 years old and 300 pounds at the time. And he beat, and he beat me. And I asked him how, and his answer, his answers and the way he went about tennis was nothing I'd ever heard to the point where I was like, either, you know, something or you're crazy. Mm -hmm. So I asked him to mentor me and he did. And he ended up coaching me for, I mean, dirt cheap. I mean, he was probably spending 30 hours a week with me and charging me $50 a week. What? And most people are charging 50 an hour. Yeah. <laughs> and, but he recognized how much I would put into it. And so I became a good, I became a better player. Um, you know, he thought I had the ability to go pro. I think looking back, he was a little delusional. <laughs> um, I mean, I too much of a head, I thought it too. And I, you know, I was too much of a head case. I mental hurdles, I couldn't get over, but I tried really hard mm -hmm. and I put a lot of effort and that became a, a foundation for, um, uh, learning things. And I became an even better coach. So he had a big, big tree of players and a big, big tree of coaches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, he said I was his best coach. Now maybe he was blowing smoke on my butt, but um, I don't think he was. And I think I was a very, very good coach. And I got, I took that very seriously, and I got even better. And I ended up coaching very seriously from age, you know, twenty three through twenty seven. Even after I started trading, I was full time coaching. Uh, my mentality was, I'm, I was making hundred dollars an hour at that point. I was like, okay, at what point is hundred dollars an hour not good enough? How much money can you where that's not good enough? Well. I ended up finding out later, but uh, at that time I was willing to take a hundred dollars an hour. It's too much. It was too much money to turn away. Plus yeah. I loved it. Mm -hmm. um, so that was just a short transition. That was kind of my experience with tennis. Good high school player. I walked onto my college team at Rutgers, never saw the light of day. Rutgers teams get uh, disbar disbanded because of uh, budget cuts. And then I just ended up becoming a coach still played from time to time, but um, love teaching more than I love playing. Interesting. It's funny how that transition happens. And I've, I've seen myself think about the coaching thing quite a bit. Um, but I don't know if I, if I want to do it, it's hard to, it's hard to say in terms of basketball or in terms of, mm -hmm. well, yeah. I think, I think coaching basketball right now probably won't be worth your time and money. I at least had tennis was worth my time and money. Mm -hmm. And I got a lot of enjoyment out of it. And I was able to give people free lessons like my coach gave to me uh, because I just was getting paid so much. But when you have a spot where you're maybe more financially settled, you you can have time to do the things that maybe don't make you money. But at 20, uh, remind me, you're 25? Yeah, I'll be 26 the day before you turn. Yeah. Well, you're okay, we can, we, can, <laughs> we can party together. We can do weed grab shots. Um, <laughs> But I think at this point in your life, you should be building and not, you know, you, I, I think the world's a better place when you can make more money and then give to charity later, as opposed to kind of struggling and giving a little bit to charity now. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Um, I've, I've often thought about that in the sense of um, the whole, like having kids sensation, which we talked about too, right? Like I'd, you know, I'd like to be able to get to a very set point and then say, okay, now I feel like I have a foundation and leverage and, you know, can afford the things that, you know, yeah. a kid should be able to and not have to sweat sleeping at night. Um, so I get what you mean on that sense or uh, on that end, because you can put your head down for six, seven years solid and make a whole lot happen and then say, okay, now it's time to do all of this. That's where I'm at now. And I'm getting to the end of the fifth year mm -hmm. of that six, seven year cycle and the fruits have paid off big time. And they're, I'm very close to where I would need to be. That's awesome, man. 
Um, so now day to day, we've talked about, you know, you're investing in real estate, you're investing your most of your time into the day trading thing. If you had to, you know, talk to someone who is my age, they are passionate about the idea of investing in real estate and they are passionate about the idea of, I want to be my own kind of boss. I want to be in charge of my own life. I want to create this life. What is it that they have to mentally try to figure out or grasp before any of that even becomes possible? Because just like in tennis, if you want to get to the next level, it's going to be more mental than it is physical at some point. Um, the same thing applies to a lot of sports, right? So how does that, how would you from, from your shoes um, kind of put that out there and, and tell someone my age? Um, one, if you haven't read Rich Dad Poor Dad, you need a framework in which to work through. And this framework that I had discovered before I met that book, but once I read that book, it contextualized everything very simply. Mm. And when I gave that book to my wife, my wife literally thought I was a crazy person. <laughs> she thought I was insane because all of our friends, our middle class, upper middle class, they all have jobs. They're all behaving a certain way. And I'm telling her that it's wrong. Mm. And I couldn't really explain why. Like I tried, but when she read that book, she goes, okay, now I get it. And it switched. So just to give you a little context, but you need to be prepared that if you're going to try to be an entrepreneur, you probably have to do things differently than your friends. If you're looking to the left and you're looking to the right and they all have jobs, you're going to operate differently. If you have a job, that means that you're not going to be able to take a vacation. You are not going to be able to um, watch Netflix. You're not going to be able to do the things that they want to do because you need to spend the time building for what you're trying to build for. And you either need to spend money, you need to either invest money or time or both, but you can't have neither. Mm -hmm. So if you need money, it means you need to be saving money. So you might have a great paying job, but your friends are going to want to go on nice vacations. They're want to, they're going to want to live in nice apartments. Um, or you don't have money. You don't have a good paying job. Well, you're going to have to learn how to make money or how to learn how to invest with no money. And that's going to take your time. So when your friends are watching Netflix or want to F around watching football on Sunday afternoon and spend six to eight hours at a bar. Yeah. That's eight hours that, adds up over time that could be invested into learning something. Mm -hmm. So those are two major, major things. I can get into more specific concepts too. No, I mean, I like that from a, a, a broad spectrum level. Okay. I would, I would love to hear um, maybe one or two more specifically nuanced things. I'll tell you what I did. Okay. Um, I started making six figures I could easily have afforded a $1,600 $1, a month apartment, right? That's what most of my friends were doing. Mm -hmm. I lived in an $800 a month apartment because the way I viewed it was that $800 a month that I was saving, $9,600 a year, right? Well, invested in the S&P 500, that doubles about every nine years. Mm. And I use the S&P 500 because that's just kind of a baseline. Yeah, baseline, yeah, for sure. But the point is, is that the opportunity cost of that money was a lot more than the $1,600 a month I was saving. It was $1,600 a month, plus what it would make if it was invested. So if that money doubles every every nine years, it's, you know, 9,600, let's just call it 10 grand. 10, 20, 40, 80, 160 over the course of uh, not 45 years. It's a lot of money to, to throw into rent that, you know, it's a, I didn't really see the much difference. So that was my mentality on every decision. Mm -hmm. And it's not that I didn't spend money and it's not that I didn't have fun. I did, but I had a budget. And when I didn't have any money, when I didn't, when the budget got allocated and I spent the money for the month, no, we didn't do, we're out. And that was the difference between me and most people is discipline and how I spent my money. Drawing bright lines, making sure that those don't get crossed. Yeah. Yeah. And people thought I was crazy. Mm, for sure. I, I've experienced that. Um, when you talk about, you know, rich dad, poor dad, Robert Kiyosaki, obviously, is there any other names that pop into your head? Like I know I've read Dave Ramsey. 
I know um, on the real estate side, Grant Cardone's a big name, right? 10X. Yeah. Um, are there any names that you refer to? I'm not big on like, you know, sucking off anybody who's famous, but. <laughs> well, I, I actually just made a post or I scheduled a post about Dave Ramsey and I love Dave Ramsey. If you're a no risk, high floor, low ceiling person, if you want to be a millionaire by the time you're in your mid fifties, early sixties, Dave Ramsey is a great follow. Mm -hmm. I don't subscribe to him because Dave does not like you to take on debt. Mm -hmm. The point is, is even though I don't follow him, it doesn't mean I don't recognize that he isn't good for a specific archetype of person. You want to work your W2 job and, you know, uh, he's a great guy to follow. Uh, real estate, it, it really depends on what you want to do. There's a million different ways to do real estate. And let's just look at it like racket sports. There's tennis, racquetball, squash, pickleball, badminton. Those are all different versions of a racket sports with completely different strategies. Same thing in real estate. Mm. So you want to find the person that matches what you want to do. If you want a flipping, we're going to find the best flipper. And there's a bunch of them. Same thing with multifamily or storage units. And the best place to start is bigger pockets. And bigger pockets is a Reddit. It's a, the concept of Reddit, but only for real estate investing. Mm. So I, there's multifamily guys that I follow, but I'm a multifamily guy. So I follow Jake and Gino. I really like them for multifamily. And there's a few others as well. Hmm. Where are, if this is uh, cool, where are most of your uh, investments in real estate? Like I know I, I've had clients before that like invested all of their, their, you know, um, properties were in the panhandle. Um, sure. like, so my, all, all my properties are in upstate New York hmm. and there's a specific reason why I'm there and I invest for cash flow. Mm -hmm. And so I look for properties that have a low uh, cost of entry, but they, the rental prices are good for how much they cost. Mm -hmm. And this, excuse me, this has its positives and negatives. And for where I am right now, um, for what my goals are, which is to develop enough passive income to be able to justify quitting trading, that's where I need to be. But I'm investing in a C class market, a C or D class market. It's not a great market. It's not like a Florida where it's on fire and people want to move there. Yeah. Um, and I'm investing in C or D class type of assets. So after a while, I would say three or four years from now, I'm going to shift into A class properties. It will be like Miami or Philadelphia, you know, great cities, stable cities, stuff like that. And that'll balance what's called, you know what a portfolio is? Yeah. I'll have a portfolio of real estate investing. Right now it's only C class, right? I want to balance within that and have some A class in there as well. But right now I'm willing to take on that risk while I'm building. Yeah, that makes sense. And with no risk, it's hard. Or the smaller the risk, the smaller the reward usually, right? Yes. There's just different types of risk. Mm -hmm. Valid. Okay. So now if you were to talk about um, that, ability to learn all those nuances and say, I want to get into investing. I want to do this. I want to do that. Is there a particular, what's the word I'm looking for? I want to say like, is there a particular strategy into knowing how much money you need to have immediately before you start doing that sort of stuff? Like, the idea of uh, I'll compare it to Ramsey, like where he's saying, okay, you need to have this much money before you take on, you know, set aside before you take on this next step. Sure. What, what does that look like? Is there, is there a formula for that? Is there a way to do that um, on a grand level or is it more so just very specific to who you are and what you need? And your so he's talking to... about like, okay, a property is a hundred thousand dollars. How much money do I need to justify doing this or I'm, I'm someone right now at, you know, 25, 26, that is long-term looking to invest in properties. Right. So how do I know where to start or what to start putting aside and then say, okay, now I take that plunge. So you have to decide on what you want to do. Right. Cause like I said, there's so many different choices. So the first, what? Yeah. So if the, if, if you want to bring that, that tennis analogy back, what would be your six or seven different real estate options? Well, there's, I mean, there's more than six or seven, but again, yeah. there's 
You, you've heard of flipping, you've property flip. You could do short-term rentals, which are like Airbnb. You can do long-term rentals, which is what I'm doing. You can do storage units, um, strip malls. Um, what else is there? Um, old people, uh, like senior citizen living type of places. Mm -hmm. Um, you can do apartment complexes. There's just, you can be a realtor, you can wholesale. This is all different things. So you kind of have to figure out what you want to do to decide how much money you need. Now, do you recommend just starting with one? Like it would be completely stupid to have a strip mall and an apartment complex and then a long term rental. You learn a lot and you will make mistakes. You will make mistakes. That's the very important thing about when you're investing. You're going to make mistakes. So make mistakes you can afford and then keep doing the same thing because you're going to get better over time. Your operations are going to get better. Mm -hmm. So I would not expect, you know, like, like we're going to go two years in on just multifamily and then we're going to add a student rental as part of a portfolio after two years. But student rentals is, it's like, it's a kind of a cousin. It's a long-term rental. It's a little bit different, you know, than just a straight long-term rental, but it's at least within the, I'm not going from, long-term rental to storage units. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. I get that. Um, so you have to figure out what you, what you want to do to decide how much money you need to save. So I would just, I would say hop on bigger pockets. There's big inner podcasts, start to get familiar with the nomenclature, start to get familiar with the terms, start to learn about these things, see what interests you, see why, you know, you might need capital right now, and you want to build your capital. So it might make sense to flip, you know, flipping houses. It's a job. It's a very active job. The nice thing is when you flip the house and you're done, you're done, mm-hmm. right? You made your money. The down, the downside is when you're done, you got to start it again. Yeah. You, you got to find the next <laughs> flip. It is your last sale. So, uh, so you figure out what you want to do, but what I, what I also want to impart on you, my partner that I partner with has $0 in any of our deals. So you do not need money to get into real estate. Mm -hmm. You need a deal. Mm. You need a deal. You need a deal getting into real estate or you need money. You don't have to have both. You have to have one. I like that. So there's the opportunity to work alongside somebody who has more capital and say, I'll handle a lot more of the, Mm -hmm. uh, the nuanced conversations and the paperwork and that sort of stuff, which, can work, you know, very synergistically. Yeah. I mean, you know, the example I always use is like, okay, you know, um, you know, uh, we know that a a bottle of Coke is a dollar. Right. And I say, Dylan, um, I can buy this bottle of Coke for 10 cents, but I don't have any money. Mm. Will you lend me 10 cents or will you invest in this Coke? You're going to go, yeah, of course I'll give you 10 cents. And I'd say, I'll split the pocket profits with you. Oh, we're going to sell this Coke for a dollar. What? Like you're going to do this in a second. Well, it's the same thing in real estate. Mm -hmm. The better the deal you can offer somebody, the more they're going to likely invest or loan you the money. True. Yeah. So you could, you could be one of two people in the, in the pursuit of getting into real estate. You can be the, I have a bunch of capital and let's put it to use and find someone who can help me do that. Yes. Or you can be the, Hey, I know all the connections. I know where to buy. I know what we can get into and I can make the, you know, the conversation happen to make the deal work for us. Now you have the money. And then there's also a third type of person is you can be the person that is maybe a combination of the first two and maybe you don't have money, but maybe you can go find it, you know, through your stuff in the gym, you might know guys that have capital and are complaining. They don't know where to invest it. And you find a good real estate deal and you bring a bunch of those guys together and you go, here's, I'm looking for a hundred thousand dollars each this is your return. This is what I'm going to do. Right. Like you can bring the capital together. Mm-hmm. Valid point. Raising capital is also a skill set. Now, let me ask you this as someone who was 26, right. Yeah. Pretty much getting into day trading um, and, and that sort of stuff. Correct. If I have that time, like yeah. it was about 25, 26. Cool. Yeah. Now, what what was it like from a mental standpoint to get over the investing money that you earned right and there's a mental there's a mental capacity yes. of saying like i have to put money in in order to make money like i got to you know i got to play the game here 
Um, and that mentally for someone who grew up in middle class and didn't necessarily have a boatload of money to just kind of throw by the wayside, um, that's challenging because it, it tends to be that like, I want to turn my money into something that I can tangibly hold on to. Right. And if it's not something, it's the actual money. And I just want to hold on to it. I want to make it. I want to hold on sure. to it. Um, how, that, that mindset it's, it's tough. How would you, how would you kind of coach somebody um, on that? Who's around my age? Uh, there's a lot of people. Question. Like what were you saying? I said, there's a lot of people out there my age that are like that, that are afraid to kind of like yes. say, okay, I have money, but I don't know what to do with it. Or it seems yeah. very scary to have a possibility of losing it. Uh, yeah. Great question. Um, uh, and this comes up a lot, not just 26 year olds. I mean, I know 60 year olds that are still like that. Mm-hmm. So I, I have an example that I use quite often. And, and first of all, you have to understand is everything we do in life is a gamble. Whether you understand it or not, you step in the car, it's a gamble. You buy a house, that's a gamble. For whatever reason, different different gambles have different contexts, right? People view buying a house as not that big of a gamble, even though it is. And so it, what I ask people is if, if you go into gamble in a casino, right? If you ever play blackjack mm-hmm. and whatever dollar amount that you feel like you can lose and be emotionless about, that's a dollar amount you should gamble with. Mm-hmm. And whether it's a gamble that you have edge in, the, like how I trade with, or it's a gamble where the house has edge, like in, in, um, um, in blackjack, you want to gamble with money you can afford to lose. So when I talked about earlier getting kicked in the teeth, right? Like I took big losses, but, you know, um, in the beginning when I was trading, like, let's say this was the amount, this was my trading account, right? And this was the $10, the blackjack $10, right? So if I lost that, was it painful? Yeah, I didn't, it's, it's a sizable portion, right? But as, as the money grows bigger and bigger, your losses will get bigger, bigger proportionally, right? But you want it to always be that emotionless loss. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to invest all of your money into a risky spot, right? Like if you wanna invest in Bitcoin, it's a really risky spot. You don't have to invest 50% or 6% of your earnings. There's nothing wrong with putting one or 2% of your paycheck in. Yeah, are you gonna are you gonna hit the ceiling that other people are? No, but you get to have exposure with that uh, exposure to a really risky, high reward investment with a little part of your portfolio. Mm-hmm. The bigger parts of your portfolio, you want them to be less risky, but pay, have a decent, decent payout. So the S and P five hundred is a really good in, index funds in their stock market. They're really traditional. They've been around for a long time. They historically make around eight percent a year, mm-hmm. right? that's the place that you can feel comfortable putting your money in as long as you don't need to take it out immediately. Right? Like it's going to go like this over time, but over time it's going to go like this. So as long as you can just keep stocking money away and putting it away over time, it's going to go like this. So the people that have fear, what they need to understand is they have to understand inflation. Mm. I think historically your money gets devalued two to 3% every year. Right? And so if it sits in the bank and you're making a quarter of a percent, but it's losing 2%, you're losing 1.75% of buying power on your money. So in order to retire, you have to make that up at least to stay, to have your money be, I shouldn't say in order to retire, in order for your money to stay stable, you have to make that up in investments. So you have to at least do that. So you have to take on some risk because just by putting it in the bank, You're you're already risking 2% 2% every year. Mm. You're just handing that back. Yeah. And that's where I think most people, especially coming out of high school and college are just blindsided. They don't understand that. Um, well, they weren't taught. Yeah, exactly. It's not, their, it's not their fault. No, 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 no. But I think too, um, and I would love to hear your perspective on this as you uh, have, you know, obviously changed your wife's perspective. Um, the idea of teaching your kids this, right? So like your daughter, um, like I know to bring him up again, Cardone, he has his daughters like making sales calls and stuff. And like, he's teaching them a lot as they're going through the process. Don't know if it's just for glamor and social media. It doesn't seem like that. Cause she's had like full on conversations on video and it looks very 
much like she's a, just a very knowledgeable 11 year old. Cause she's been around it. Um, where do you see that change coming from? Do you see like anything changing, uh, from an education standpoint, or do you just see yourself kind of doing your part and teaching your child that? Um, uh, so I am going to teach my daughter similar to what Grant does. Like she's going to learn the business. She's going to, I'm going to teach her skill sets, take her in the real world. And I'm not going to give her very much. I believe that hunger is what creates. I've been around a lot of kids that have been giving stuff. And for the most part, they're mostly unhappy because they never earn anything. Uh, so she's not going to get everything. Uh, as far as giving back, I'm currently writing a book. Um, and I want to teach. I, I don't think that going to college is the best thing for most people. Um, but if you're dead set on going and you think what I want to do is teach um, high school kids and their parents how to make the decision on how to analyze college as an investment. How much do you spend and why? How you can game the system. So I want to teach them to think as investors and use college as the vehicle. Mm. Uh, so that's a way to get back. I've been kind of passionate about it. We're, you know, everybody knows that college is too expensive. Like we've gotten to that point now, yeah. but no one knows how to, how expensive is it? And they can't pinpoint a dollar amount. Or what that investment is worth in five years. Right. And, and how that kind of pans out. What's the ceiling yeah. for the investment? I mean, I'm starting to see books and articles about stuff like that. They're giving the direct ROI of certain majors and certain colleges, which is good, but it's not enough. Yeah. So I'm taking it to another level. And also the, the gaming of the system and teaching people to think critically about money. Like that example I gave about the opportunity cost of the rent, that's going to be the foundation of how you think. So it's like, if you're spending an extra 40 K in, in loans, what is that? What does that opportunity cost? What does your life look like because of that? So we go through budgeting and like, if you live in, if you have a job, if you're a nurse and you live in New York versus being a nurse and living in Florida versus Las Vegas, it's like, what does your life look like? Mm. Like tangibly. So, because that's the problem with 18 year olds is they, they're just like going all in. They're doing what everyone's telling them to do. And they have no idea what their life's going to turn out. And most of them, as you're aware of, like are trapped. Yeah. They have too much debt. And their job isn't going to pay it off. Yeah. I mean, I get it. <laughs> um, yeah. It, and it's interesting to see how the idea that you mentioned earlier, you know, some people are fearful of investing in a property, but they'll gladly put a hundred plus thousand dollars into into a college education, not even necessarily like as an 18 year old, but I mean, someone could easily, you know, be afraid to invest their money as a 45 year old parent yeah. and they're not seeing the upside of doing that. But then all of a sudden they co-sign all these loans for their kid to go to college. Um, it's, it's interesting. Well, I mean, that's, so what you have to understand is the college thing is a dogmatic principle. It is built, it is woven in the fabric of, of our society. Society for sure. And I go into that in the book of how parents in the 70s that went to college or didn't go to college in the 70s and the 80s, they saw the people that did had a guaranteed job and made good money. And they, their life was just so much better. So they told everyone in their generation, oh, we're going to college. You have to go to college, you have to go to college, right? And that and uh, the culture shifted. Yeah. And then in terms of investing in real estate, we have to understand about investing and what, and, and this, these are studies of McDonald's. People would rather not lose a dollar than make $5, right? They're scared of losing. They're emotionally scared of losing, mm. right? So if I tell you that we can flip a coin and that we have a 50-50 investment of, you have a 50-50 chance of flipping the, of, of, uh, of winning or losing, people will generally err on the side of not gambling in that spot. Mm -hmm. Even if I tell you that like, you actually have a 51% chance of winning and a 49% chance of losing. They're just, they just have a fear and it's something that you have to get over. It's a valid point. Yeah. And it's something that you think just happens through time and making small investments of things that you 
you can wrap your head around maybe pushing the envelope every once in a while. But for the most part, it's something that you just kind of have to get your brain used to losing. Yeah. I'm going to make small investments, things that I think I can deal with now. And I'm going to continue to increase the size of those as my ceiling. Yeah. Well, with day trading, what you have to understand is that I can make an investment and it can go to zero. Right. So I'm using that kind of analogy, right? But real estate, we have to use a different analogy. We have to use a different thought process, right? So if you buy whatever, let's say you buy a half a million dollar home and you buy it in cash, right? You buy a half, you spend a half a million dollars. It's, it's very unlikely that property is going to go to zero, right? If you've done any type of research and you know the area and you know the comps and you hire an appraiser, the appraiser is going to appraise the house. He's going to look at other houses in the area. So your chance of it going to zero is so, so small, like less than, less than, way less than a quarter of a percent. Mm -hmm. But if you miss something in the foundation or the roof or whatever, it might cost you more money to fix, or you might have to sell it and you might have to take a 50 K loss or maybe a hundred K loss in some sort of catastrophic event. So it might lose 20%. So in the context of real estate, it's like, you're going to have to put more money up, but you're not going to lose all your money. That's a great point. Very hard to, uh, obviously. And right. You have an asset, you have land, you know what that's worth. Yeah. Even in the event of a tornado or something taking the house, right. If we're talking like Midwest, you probably uh, have insurance. Exactly. I was going to say insurance is going to cover that. So, um, interesting. And people obviously, you know, when you think of where my mind started to go is something smaller, like something that everyone invests in once again is a car, right? For the most part, how would you spin that saying leasing versus, you know, owning? How, how does that compare? Does it compare? Is there a relationship there? Is there an analogy you have for that? Uh, well, first of all, I want to correct you on a word you're saying, maybe correcting is a bad word, sister podcast, but, uh, a car is not an investment. Mm-hmm. A car is a liability. Dude, uh, so, it. and this you'll get from Rich Dad Poor Dad. Um, uh, assets bring in money, liabilities take away money. Mm-hmm. So even though your home that you live in, that you buy, people think is a good investment. It could be, we don't know, but until you sell it, it's a liability. Because every money, m- month, um, every month money has to come out of your bank account to pay that mortgage, to pay the taxes, to pay that, whatever you're doing. Same thing with the rent, same thing with the car. As far as leasing versus buying, it's an individual basis on the risk reward, right? Like if you're buying a beater for a thousand dollars, right? Like, and you can take the money that would have otherwise been invested in in a a car and go invest somewhere else, buy a business, you know, it's like, yeah, I'm going to say invest in that. If it's lease versus buying, it's like, you you have to put me in context. Are you leasing a car for 200? Sure. If you I think the initial thing I was looking for was how you explained it right off the bat. Okay. You're just saying uh, the, the asset versus liability. Yeah. Like, uh, go ahead. I think that, I think that just paints a picture for the listener. Um, obviously it paints a little bit of a picture for me, um, but that just light bulb already went off. Uh, I, I also want to touch, touch on something um, just to, because we're in South Florida and for sure. Um, I, my car is a 2018 Honda. It's $30,000 brand new. CRV. I, yeah, it's a CRV. I have a $15,000 Rolex, right? Mm-hmm. Most people have a $50,000 car, whether they lease or buy before they have a Rolex. I decided I wanted something fun. I had made a goal. Uh, I don't, I said 15,000, not 50,000, but yeah. so I had a goal. And I could have gotten a much nicer car, right? Mm -hmm. But a car is a depreciating asset. A Rolex theoretically is an appreciation asset. Mm. Most people will have the nice car before they have the Rolex. But if you're going to put money into something fun, right? At least putting something in, I would get get a nice watch that appreciates over a car which depreciates. If something happens, I need to turn around and sell that watch. Maybe I'll take a thousand dollar loss. I won't, but it's already appreciated. But, um, you know, the car... You drive that off the lot, you're it's already lost uh it's already lost six to ten percent of its value. Yeah. Exactly. So if you're gonna have something fun or you have room in your budget for something fun, a watch makes a lot of a lot more sense than a car. 
So I took that 15,000 and instead of that going to zero over 10 years, it's now on a watch that will go to, you know, it's, it's worth about 18 now. And I'm, mm-hmm. We're in a crazy time. I only bought it a few months ago, but uh, <laughs> in a normal, I think in a normal scenario, it, you know, maybe it goes up five or 10% a year or something. I was going to say it's undoubtedly going to go up higher than inflation would. Yes. So there's your, you know, kit and caboodles right there. It's, it's an asset, right? It's, uh, it's you, appreciated. You, you see a lot of guys in South Florida with a lot of liabilities. Mm-hmm. They will portray themselves like they have a lot of assets, mm. but they don't own anything. They don't have real estate. You know, they, everything's on what you can see. Yeah. I Those like that. So I feel like we covered a lot of bases. Is there any other ones that you want to cover specifically? I mean, talk about the herd mentality, talk about real estate, uh, talk about trading. I don't think there's any specific topics. I mean, I really just try to get through like mindset and how you have to think and for sure, which is why I, I knew you would crush this because that's kind of how I like to approach most of these things. Most people, regardless of what you're doing, it comes down to a mindset. Obviously the nomenclature and everything like that applies to whatever industry it is, but um, you're definitely someone who's applied your mindset across multiple different you know, uh, skill sets or industries and you've found success in every single one of them. So mindset, ignore, ignore the noise we didn't talk about my poker career, but essentially, you know, when I got into trading, I was told don't do it. When I got into, uh, real estate investing, I was told don't do it. It's too risky. When I got into poker, I was told it don't do it. It's too risky. Right. Like the herd is going to tell you about risk and the herd does not know about risk. You know, your middle-class families are just not your teachers and your doctor, your lawyers are probably not going to understand risk. You have to just fight through that. They, they have bosses that take all the risk They're, I mean, they're taking on a ton of risk with W2 jobs. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, I guess the way I was looking at it, uh, would be that, you know, they're usually taking advice or, or getting told what to do by someone who has more, you know, uh, kind of playable options. They're kind of managing other things. In some cases, it's a state or federal government, which is a business who's, you know, which is ran by a group of people, but yeah, less. I mean, if you're, if you're in some company, right. And you're, I don't know, you're working tech in some company and you're the boss, right. He's also working in that company. He's also a W-2 job. Maybe he's got some options with the company, but he's in what's what we call, have you ever heard of the golden handcuffs? No, I don't think so. I mean, the golden handcuffs are, they give you, they give you enough that quitting is a real risk. Like if you have a $250,000 a year job in Florida, that's a real risk to quit. Yeah. Right. And they give you stock options and they make it seem like you're making a lot of money, but you are handcuffed. And there's no getting out. And then you get a house, then you get a family and that's it. You're just locked in for life. And some people like that. But then that's the other thing too, is that you're handcuffed and they're not because they'll swipe the rug out from under your feet very quickly and fill your position. That's why having a W2 job is risky. There's certain places where it isn't, you know, nurse, Mm -hmm. it's not, you know, they're high demand. Um, but it's, it's very risky. And what you have to understand about employers is that if you're working a job, I don't care what it is. I don't care if you're making $10 an hour, a hundred dollars an hour, you are providing more value than that. That's how companies make money. Mm-hmm. Right now, if you're, if you're working for $10 an hour and you're providing $15 an hour worth of value, if you try to charge your boss $15 an hour, the boss would just close up shop. If enough people did that, because it wouldn't be incentivized. Mm -hmm. So that, that does get a bad rap that like employers, um, take advantage of their employees. And I'm sure there is some of that, but in a capitalistic society, you need incentives for people to work hard and try to leverage their skill set. So taxes are incentives, getting employees to work for less than they're valued for, or less than their, their pure market value is an incentive. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but when you take those incentives away, um, you, there are many examples of countries that just don't produce as much as capitalistic countries. Yeah. So um, there's just no infrastructure for it. Right. So back to the W, the risk is like you're giving up value. Mm-hmm. If you have those skill sets, I'd rather go work a job and, and cap, recapture that or open up a company and, and capture that value. It might not be a linear. It might. The problem is it's not a linear. Capture, not linear at all. Yeah. Right? It's like you're not making 250. You're making like 20, 20, 10, 20, 20, a million. You know, it's like that's the way a lot of companies go is there's like a big gap year. And the other thing, too, is is you're developing the infrastructure if you're going to take your skill set and go make your own, because, yeah, there's there's systems out there, but none of it, it's the turnkey option of saying, well, I don't have to as a nurse, I don't have to worry about the hospital name and the way they get their ambulances and all the you know, they're just yeah. walking in and they're saying, OK. I'm here. I'll do what I have to do. I don't have to worry about all this other nonsense, you know, um, on the outside. I don't have to worry about how a patient's getting to me, how I'm getting to a patient, how I'm getting the the supplies that I need in order to treat that patient and all that. So that's a broad spectrum example, but, um, yeah, the, the, the risk is that you have no say and that they can replace you at any given time. Cool. Uh, agreed. And that's why it scares me. Yeah, <laughs> it would scare me to do which, that. Which makes sense. It scares you more than investing your money for uh, a piece of property in upstate New York or on uh, you know a new company that's going public. Yeah, my my uh, stock market trades are pretty pretty boring. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. They're pretty missionary. It's like some S and P five hundreds, some Apple, some Google, some Blackstone. You know, Black. Blackstone, like stuff like Disney, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't really invest in stuff like that. I like my, my equities and stocks. I just want them to be solid. You know, my real estate portfolio is kind of more on the riskier side. So I want my other, my other portfolio to be a little bit more balanced and a little bit less on the riskier side. No, that makes sense. Uh, you got to have, as you mentioned, balance. Um, I have a couple of quick baller questions for you. Um, coolest person you've ever sat in a room with? Uh, off the top of my head, probably Adam Graves. Um, Adam Graves was, a, I think he's a hall of fame, New York Ranger. Mm-hmm. And I went up to, when I worked for the Knicks, I went up to John Stockton and asked him if I can buy him a cup of coffee and pick his brain. Told me he didn't have time. I went up to Adam Graves and he gave me an hour. So wow. that was pretty cool. Um, John Stockton. <laughs> I got what? What John Starks? I, no, I said so. Fuck John Stark. Stockton. Yeah, I mean, fuck. John, I mean, who can't, like maybe he was busy. I don't know, but he didn't <laughs> want to deal with me. That's. I mean, it's yeah. doesn't have to get back. Um, I played poker with Kevin Hart, um, which was kind of cool. But yeah, let's go with Adam Graves. Okay, cool. Um, let's go. Uh, coolest place you've ever been outside of the United States? Um, I really love Vancouver. Um, Mm -hmm. I spent, when I came down to Florida, um, I visited my friend who lived in Las Olas and I went back and told my wife we're moving there and we did. And same vibe and went to Vancouver. So yeah, like I really like that city. It's a really just a lot of stuff to do and great weather. Cool. Interesting. Great yeah. weather. Huh? I believe it or not, I have not traveled that much abroad. Okay. So I didn't have any money in my early twenties. Yeah. And then when I started getting money, it, it's like taking a week or two off of trading was just not that it's like, I didn't want to lose the money. It wasn't the cost of the vacation. It was the cost of not working. If you're not making yeah. work working. Yeah. So for seven years, I didn't really vacation. And then at some point shortly after that, I had kids. Mm-hmm. So I would say we're not going to start vacation like crazy for another year or so, but then we're going to start to spend a month in different countries. Nice. Like we want to do a month in Greece one year, a month in Italy, you know, that's super cool. I like that idea. And that's the same concept that you mentioned before, right? Head down, do what you got to do and then live, you know, pretty much at, at your own pace, however you'd like to. 
within certain means, but yeah, I mean, my life's sweet now. Like, uh, con- like the average person would go like, Oh, like, why are you doing all that? Your life's amazing. You make, you make good money. Like, well, I'm, you know, candidly, I'm trying to get to 50 K a month in passive income. It's like, that's a lot. That's a lot of money. Like from a guy who's poor who had no money, like that's crazy, but that takes sacrifice. Mm-hmm. So it's all front end to the, be able to just kind of chill, have the option to chill. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, favorite exercise that you've done with me at the gym so far? Uh, jeez. <laughs> well, the, um, what's the stuff we use on the floor? The, the feet, the valve slides. Yeah. So I really like that because they crush my abs and everyone likes mm-hmm. your abs to get crushed. Um, I, like you're putting me on the spot here and I have a terrible memory for stuff no, like that. So good. I know. So what, what, I, what I will say is that what I appreciate the most about you is you like your ability. So when you teach, right? Like I taught tennis, right? You teach, everyone teaches on a bell curve, right? Mm-hmm. And the, the reason that uh, students, you, you form your teaching that way is because most of your students learn within that bell curve, right? So you say a particular word, a particular phrase in a particular way, and most students receive it correctly. And you can tell they're receiving it correctly because they're doing it the way that you want them to, right? Mm-hmm. But as you get, so you have this bell curve, right? So as you get along the outsides of the bell curve, right, you have to change up the way you're saying it, different words, different keywords to get to trigger in your student's brain. You do that very, very well because I also learn differently than a lot of people, right? Like, and you've seen that, like I, my brain kind of thinks differently. So even though I'm a decent athlete and I can pick up a lot of stuff, sometimes my brain just doesn't get it no matter, and no matter how easily you say it in that bell curve and I'll see you switch up like this Mm, and you'll change the way you're saying it and you'll evolve really quickly. So I know you're a higher level instructor. Mm. Do you, have you, have you picked up on that? You're doing that. Yeah. Uh, but it's always good to get reassurance okay. uh, when I've, I've worked with the spectrum of 92 years old to yeah. uh, the most elite athletes in the world. Um, so I've, I've experienced every little, you know, it, you know, ounce of capability. And then I've also experienced all of the different learning uh, right. or, or styles. So uh, I would like to say that I've I've really narrowed down the queuing and the understanding of house, and I think that's why also why I'm not to praise myself here, but good at doing the podcast is I think I meet people really well where they are, and I have a, a wide spectrum of being able to converse with people, understanding what tone's going to make them say, okay, I have to pay attention, or understanding what. Um, you know, what demeanor is going to allow them to feel comfortable, but also feel like they're being heard. Um, Those sorts of things have, have come naturally to me, but I don't know if that's a result of me just being around older people my whole life. I was always the youngest of five, like, you know, you know, so probably, yeah, those things have um, become very apparent to me over the last couple of years. And uh, I think, um, it, it's only getting fine tuned by working, uh, at, you know, in, in South Florida specifically. Well, the more you do it and the more eclectic group, the better you're going to get it. If you care and you think about how you're doing things, some people, yeah. they never change. They're doing the same stuff they're doing 20 years ago. That's it's a valid great. point. I'm, I'm a big efficiency guy and I know you yeah. are too. That's, well, you're, you're a critical thinker. <clears throat> valid. And that's a big thing. Like I'm very good at recognizing that very quickly, mm. you know, how you process things. And uh, one thing about your personality is you're very disarming in a good way, right? Like you're non-threatening in terms of like your ego. I don't know if you have an ego. I assume you do, but you don't present it on the forefront of your, you know, like the way a lot of people do. So that really, to, especially to men is, you know, uh, you're going to get into conversations because people aren't threatened by you. That's a valid point. Yeah. They don't feel like they have to, uh, show that kind of masculinity and prove it in a sense. Yeah. So, like I'm tougher than you or I can do this or that. Yeah. I, I, I just think that's naturally how we should communicate. I don't know what's made me necessarily have that 
click a little easier than most people, but it's something that I kind of take pride on because I don't think I was like that as a young kid. And when I recognized that I appreciated that in people that were older than me and that I could feel like I could talk to, then I was like, all right, this, this makes life a lot easier if, if people actually come to me with those um, conversations and feel comfortable doing so instead of me always just prying information out of people yeah, like me. Um, <laughs> and it has its ups and downsides, right? Like when you deal with someone that maybe is more passive, they might not immediately, you know, might take, t- might take more time. Whereas like I have the ability to claw things out of things, people really, Very really good. easily. Mm-hmm. And I learn a lot from passive people. Like I have a lot of passive friends that do really, really good things. So I try to incorporate that when I see it, it's not my natural personality, Mm -hmm. you know, but there's definitely, once again, the desire for you to learn from those sorts of people and, and take a piece of it and say, okay, how can I, how can I apply this to, you know, my day to day, which I think is why me and you get along very cohesively. We might be on two different ends of the spectrum in a sense, but, um, we're very much going about it the same way. Yeah. How we're critically thinking through the things we are doing, we're conversing about the fact that we're always learning, the fact that we're always trying to increase the efficiency just a little bit of whether it's an exercise or the way we communicate um, a a said story or tactic. It's kind of uh, all in the same ballpark mindset wise. Um, Yeah. I mean, I think we're, yeah, I think I'm like maybe just 10 years ahead of you, but we kind of come from the same mold. We might execute slightly different, but we, that mental mold. And I have this thing about me that I do not care about being right. I only care about the truth. So if you tell me that I'm doing something wrong and it makes sense, I'm going to switch. Yeah. I don't care. I don't, um, you know, you asked me if I wanted to leave something with, and I did forget about this. This is a big problem with people, something called the sunk cost fallacy, mm-hmm. which is uh, two things. Like people, they've been ingrained to feeling right is a good thing. Like if you're right, you feel good about it. And if you're wrong, you feel bad. Mm-hmm. And it, in truth, if you're wrong, you should feel good in that, okay, I've discovered the wrong answer let me learn. And now, okay, I know not to do that again. It's and if you were right, well, well, I'm sorry, what was that? It's a step in the right direction. Right. Yeah. And then if you're right, well, you knew you're right. You don't have to, you know, beat your chest about it. Great. And you just move on with your day. And then that connects to some cost fallacy is if you sunk time and effort into a thought process or uh, a, I, I use a car, right? You buy a car, you buy for 5,000, you sink 3,000 in because the engine goes, then you sink 2,000 into the transmission. All of a sudden you keep sinking money and it's, you gotta let it go. It's a bad investment. Well, when people are wrong about something, they tend to t- dig their heels in because they've emotionally sunk things into that. They're invested into that. And they, they lose out on so much upside by, 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 uh, not willing to evolve quick enough. Mm-hmm. You know, they're ju- they just get such, they, they get emotionally sunk in and you see that in politics, right? Like yeah, so you see it all the time. In politics. That's where it gets exact. That's where it gets illuminated the most, but you'll see it everywhere, man. Like if you pay attention to it, it explains a lot of emotional behavior to people. Yeah. And I think, uh, that, that inability to disassociate the feelings from being right to getting it right. Yeah. Are, are huge. Um, I had a client actually share that line with me. He said that whenever he goes into any sort of business meeting or any sort of, um, you know, investment, uh, opportunity, and he's, talking with somebody or it's a job opportunity, he always leads with that. He said, I always lead with, I'm not interested in being right. I'm just interested in getting it right. So whatever we have to do to figure that out, I'm here Wow. to, to figure that I'm, I'm here for that. I never thought to lead with that. I'm, gonna, I'm stealing that now. That's awesome. Yeah, no. And I, I asked him, I was like, can I steal that? Because <laughs> yeah. that just makes way too much sense. Like 
it, it speaks to my personality tenfold as yes. to how I want to get better at teaching people um, good nutrition habits, proper movement techniques, and, and uh, just overall business and life you know, whether it's a relationship with a loved one or it's, you know, trying to teach somebody the ins and outs of their dietary habits. Like I'm not interested in being right. I'm just interested in getting it right. So let's make sure that we're both on the same page and we can move forward with that intent. We don't have to question that anymore. I, man, uh, I want to meet this guy. Do I, is he, is he in the gym around while I'm in the gym? No, he's not. He, uh, he actually does virtual training. So I might, might be able to connect you to him. We'll see. Yeah. I'm, I'm already in love. <laughs> he's a, he's a very dry humor guy too. Uh, oh, that's cool. You yeah. might, you might, you might connect with him very well. Get along. Awesome. <laughs> um, I always like to turn the envelope uh, or pass the baton, whatever you'd like to say. Uh, if you want to ask me a question or two, feel free. I know we kind of already talked about it, but. What are your goals, man? Like we, we kind of, kind of gone on this a little bit, but you know, I know you want to travel. Do you have financial goal? Like what are, what are you trying to get to? Financially? Um, I know that I have, a, you know, what's my base? What is my monthly expenditure on a living a little above my, you know, necessities. And then also just the bare necessities. I know what both of those are. I'd like to get to a point where my e-commerce business is allowing me to double that. Um, and that's where I can start to allocate my time into more of the real estate type of stuff um, and more of that. So it's really like a step-by-step process um, trying to figure out what percentage of my time do I need to spend trading time for money? And what percentage of my time should I be allocating to working with minimal upside right now with the potential of, you know, huge exponential increase over the next two to three years? Um, Uh, Probably 30 hours a week. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, And then that's in my transition right now for, from day to day um, because of what's going on at the gym, it's now, putting all of those things aside, um, and getting certain assets, you know, kind of lined up. Um, and that's where I'm just trying to get all those things in order ducks in a row so that I have a clear and concise path. Cause right now it's a little too split down the middle for me to see. Um, and it's hard to merge those things together. So, um, you know, like I mentioned, e-commerce uh, through customers and expanding distribution um, with other like-minded people can continue to increase the percentage of that that's taking up my monthly expenses, then move beyond that to doubling it. And then I can spend a lot more of my time um, kind of facilitating those other things that I want to take advantage of, traveling a little bit more um, to spread the things like the podcast, to spread things like my brand and just how I envision, um, but also to continue expanding distribution because traveling is an easier way to do that, or it's a good way to do that, but it does take more upfront money than what I could do here and take advantage of like the local scene. Um, it's a good plan. (laughs) So, Uh, where, if someone wanted to contact you and say, get some information on you, uh, how would they be able to find you, learn a little bit, maybe reach out and talk to you? Uh, sorry, I'm just looking at my Twitter handle because I always I forget if there's a hyphen in it. Um, <laughs> so they can email me, um, which is uh, Chad Castell, uh, C H A D K A S T E L, at gmail.com. And then they can reach me on Twitter at, at Chad underscore Castell. Beautiful. Those are two good ways. Um, you're, you're pretty constant on Twitter. Well, I am now. Yeah. Okay. Do you follow me? I guess you do. I think so. Yeah. yeah. I, think yeah. I mean, I, I, I just started posting like not super long ago. 
Okay. Um, so I was like very dark on social media and all of a sudden I've come alive and I'm posting all the time and people are like, what is going on? <laughs> um, is it, uh, is it a flood of creativity or is it just a desire for outlet? Um, so a little bit of that, like I talk too much about this shit at, sorry, I talk too much about this stuff. I'm looking no, for a little bit of an outlet, at, so I don't have to annoy my friends and family. Mm -hmm. Um, cause I really just focused in on retirement. Like that's kind of been like everything. Um, so I need to like go back to being able to talk to them about sports. And a lot of it is like, I don't know where I'm going to be in two years. And I don't know if I'm going to want to do consulting on real estate investing or syndicating, which is essentially, um, bringing together different investors to invest in a bigger project. Like if mm -hmm. I want to go, if I want to go buy a $30 million, $30 million building today, I can't do it. So yes. that, so that three or four other people and on the, you know, Gotcha. Right. So that's like one reason. Um, and then if it ends up, I don't need that or I want fine, but I'm starting now and I'm just bringing value to people. I'm not asking anybody for anything. I'm just giving, letting them peer into my brain. I'm going to show investments that I'm doing, rehabs I'm doing, stuff like that. So they can just see what's going on. And then down the road, if, if I've developed a brand with them and I've built relationships, then maybe I'll go in that direction. And if I don't, you know, it's cost me some time and, and money, but I forgot to tell you about something. Let's hear it. Well, more of a kind of a tell you slash pitch you. So what I do with my partner in New York, the one who has zero dollars invested is I invest the entire, every dollar. Mm -hmm. And when I've been paid back my principal, so if I buy a house for a hundred thousand, when I get my hundred thousand dollars back, he's a 40% owner in the property and a 40% owner in the cash flow. Mm. So I'm trying to do that in other businesses, right? Okay. Like be the, be the bank, um, uh, be the bank, um, and be guidance. Mm -hmm. And then for return, I get a return on my money. I believe that his return is worth somewhere between 25 and 35%, but I gave him 40 for a couple of reasons. One is I want our interests to be very much aligned. Mm -hmm. I don't win unless he wins and vice versa. So he's not going to put a tenant in that might leave shortly because the tenant leaves, he's not making money. And the other thing is I don't want him to leave, right? Like I don't want him to feel like I edged him out and get, got like this perfect deal. It's like I gave him 40 and in a few years, he's going to go like, wow, you gave me a really good deal. And like, we're going to be partners for a long time. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to do that in other contexts. So I have a lot of other business ideas that I think have high ceilings and, you know, I'm always looking for partners on that type of stuff. Cool. I like that. We'll definitely have to talk more. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I would love to also show you, I think I mentioned um, the e-commerce business plan and, and how that works um, sure. and get your uh, insights and see if it's something that aligns. So uh, with that being said, man, I'm excited. Thank you. Me too. Uh, this, was, this was cool. Thank I mean, you for having me on. Yeah, of course, man. Uh, you know, we're just, we, we clicked very quickly and it, it was yeah. apparent. So let's keep that ball rolling. Um, I appreciate, you know, all my clients who come in and have a desire to learn. It's so much more engaging and so much more fun. Um, and uh, I, I do appreciate that. So it, that doesn't go unnoticed as well. Yeah, I'm number one. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, for everyone listening, uh, thank you for, for tuning in. Um, definitely go contact Chad if you, uh, have any, uh, business ideas or, uh, questions. Mm -hmm. And, um, as I always say, I am, we are, life is limitless. See you next time. Goodbye.